April is the cruelest month, which is why I am starting my look at films on literary figures in March. And I'm starting with the 20th century's greatest poet, T.S. Eliot. Tom and Viv is a 1994 film based on the 1984 play of the same name by Michael Hastings. Tom and Viv tells the story of the marriage between T.S. Eliot, played by William Defoe, and his first wife, Vivian Hay Wood, played by Miranda Richardson. The two married in 1915, but as Vivian's mental issues became more and more disruptive, they separated in 1933. Vivian's relationship with Eliot has often been seen as either having lured him into a disastrous marriage or having been a major influence on his most famous work, 1922's epic poem, The Wasteland. And furthermore, much has been made on what role, if any, Eliot had in Vivian's mental breakdown and eventual institutionalization. The scholarly debate on the Tom and Vivian Eliot relationship boils down to essentially this. Vivian was like amazeballs and Tom, well, was totally gay. Like, OMG, Eliot was so soups amaze and Viv was like totes cray cray. Hastings' play was based on material provided by Vivian's brother, Morris Hay Wood. Eliot's second wife, Valerie, held tight control over her husband's estate and the copyright on Vivian's letters. She's alleged to have referred to it as that dreadful play, and later when the film was released, she gave an interview to defend her husband in the face of the film's portrayal of him. While Valerie Elliott didn't much care for Michael Hastings' play, she did give Andrew Lloyd Webber the rights to turn Old Possum's book of Practical Cats into this. And we all say, oh, well, I never was there ever a cat so clever as a magic. Thomas Stearns Eliot was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1888. He was the son of Henry Ware Eliot, president of the Hydraulic Press Brick Company, and Charlotte Stamp Stearns, an amateur poet. Despite his childhood in what was still frontier territory, his family was originally from New England. Eliot was educated at Harvard, and then at the Sorbonne, and then at Oxford, where he worked on but never completed a PhD in philosophy. It is here where the film introduces us to both Tom and Viv, with Elliot gazing at her from a window as she prances about the courtyard. Elliot is in a class being taught by philosopher and mathematician Bertrand Russell, who is alleged had an affair with Vivian, possibly with Elliot's knowledge. But more on that later. The shy 26-year-old Elliot first met Vivian at a dance in London. They later met again at a lunch party held by a mutual friend. By this time, Elliot was at Oxford and found it quite boring, saying, I hate university towns and university people, who are the same everywhere, with pregnant wives, sprawling children, many books, and hideous pictures on the walls. Oxford is very pretty, but I don't like to be dead. I dispute that statement, as I lived in a university town for four years. And mine also had lusty seminarians, and lots of squirrels. Vivian Haywood was born in Bury in Lancashire. She preferred to be called Vivian, or Vivi, but never Viv. Her father was Charles Haywood, who the film presents as being ignorant of the arts, but in fact, he was an artist and a member of the Royal Academy of Arts. Later, Charles Haywood inherited his mother's property and became a landlord. As a child, Vivian suffered from tuberculosis of the wrist and was treated by Frederick Treves, future physician to the royal family, and who is perhaps best known for his involvement with the elephant man, Joseph Merrick. Vivian's medical woes continued as she entered puberty, and the cost of her medicinal treatment brought her much resentment from within her family. For most of her adult life, she suffered from irregular and heavy menstrual periods, something which apparently shocked the virginal Elliot on their honeymoon night. Vivian also had severe premenstrual tension, including mood swings and migraines. I feel somewhat unqualified to talk about this. Vivian and Elliot married after a brief affair in 1915, and neither told their parents. Elliot was only supposed to spend a year in Oxford. His time in Europe was supposed to be his grand tour, and while it could be accepted that he might sow his wild oats, he certainly wasn't expected to marry a woman like Vivian. After all, she smoked in public, she liked to dance, and she was quite outspoken. And women in this period 
weren't expected to do anything remotely interesting. Elliot seemingly saw his relationship with Vivian as a chance to escape from his parents' planned life for him. They wanted him to return to Harvard and lecture in philosophy. He wished to write poetry. Later in life, Elliot would say that he was immature and convinced himself that he was in love with her. But her love for poetry and art was most likely appealing to him. And for her part, Vivian was devoted to him. It was in 1915, too, that the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock was published. And rather than Vivian, as the film suggests, it was poet Ezra Pound who convinced Eliot that poetry could be a vocation. Despite his belief that poetry was impersonal, the main character in Prufrock seems very much like Eliot himself, uncomfortable and reserved. And I can see how the idea of being drawn out by an extrovert like Vivian would have been alluring to him. Early on in their marriage, the two became financially dependent upon Bertrand Russell. As Eliot made his foray into trying to become a poet, Russell, the renowned philosopher, mathematician, historian and social critic, had been Eliot's tutor, and said of the Eliots that she says she married him to stimulate him, but finds she can't do it. Obviously, he married to be stimulated. I think she will soon be tired of him. There has been much suggestion that Russell, who had a great interest in trying to help the couple, not just financially, but emotionally, had an affair with Vivian. It is a mind-blowing idea that the authors of The Wasteland and Why I'm Not a Christian were involved in some kind of menage a trois. But to me, it seems like it's just a bit of intellectual slash fic. To be fair to the film, it doesn't overtly suggest this and has Russell outright state that there is nothing going on between them in a scene set upon Elliot's arrival to attend to a sick Vivian who has gone on holiday with Russell. This excursion did in fact happen, and afterwards Elliot said that Russell had helped save the unstable Vivian's life. But it does show the Elliots and Russell, especially Vivian and Russell, as being very close. Such as the scene where Vivian and Russell are shown dancing provocatively as Elliot sits outside. Russell, who wasn't one to keep his affairs secret, said that he wouldn't engage in such things with Vivian because of her illness. Elliot generally spoke of sex in perfunctory ways, such as calling it pneumatic bliss. And with Vivian being erratic and prone to mood swings, the idea of a menage seems a bit outlandish, especially the suggestions that Elliot was willfully involved in any kind of tryst. It seems a bit out of character for a man who later took a vow of celibacy. Most of the evidence for it comes from third-party sources, and it's usually from those who want to paint Elliot in a negative light. Of course, I am a historian, and am by nature objective. I wouldn't dare show any lack of objectivity. One thing the film really tries to get over is the idea of Vivian as Elliot's muse. And while there is evidence to suggest that Elliot did seek her approval on certain things, and she did contribute to the criterion, the film, I feel, exaggerates her role, especially in the writing of The Wasteland. Vivian's entire contribution to the wasteland was a couple of scrawls in the margin and a little line change. But the film has her sitting in a typewriter, practically writing the damn thing. Elliot composed the wasteland over a series of years before it was finally published in 1922. During this period, he was diagnosed with a nervous disorder and suffered a breakdown. He and Vivian travelled to the coastal town of Margate so he could rest, taking some time away from his working at Lloyd's of London. That's right, the composer of one of the greatest poems of the 20th century was, at the time of his publication, working in a bank. Perhaps if more bankers wrote poetry, we all might be better off. He produced the first draft while seeking treatment for his condition in Switzerland, and showed it to his friend, the poet Ezra Pound. The film never mentions him, but Ezra Pound was essentially the editor of the poem. In a poem he wrote, he described the wasteland as though Elliot were its mother and he the midwife. What Vivian did was mostly write wonderful and splendid in the margins. The whole film really overplays her role in the writing of the poem. As though to make Elliot out to be some kind of fraud. Originally called He Do the Police in Different Voices, the 433 line poem is divided into five parts, which are seemingly unrelated and make numerous references to everything from Homer to Dante to Charles Dickens to Shakespeare and the Buddhist fire sermon. 
It is many things. It is a reaction to the fragmented, depressed state of post-war Great Britain. Unreal city, under the brown fog of a winter dawn, a crowd flowed over London Bridge. So many I had not thought death had undone so many. And in some cases the product of Eliot's own mental state as a result of his breakdown and the fact that his marriage was floundering. It's a wonderful poem. It's so elegant, so expertly crafted. And every time you look at it you experience something new. But this bloody film wants you to think that T.S. Eliot couldn't have possibly written it. No, it was written by his wife because Tom was far too busy off swanning with the Bishop of Oxford. And that's another thing. Vivian calls Eliot an unbeliever, but in fact he was quite religious. He was raised Unitarian, but during the period he wrote The Wasteland was quite interested in Buddhism. Although he felt being a Westerner it would be very difficult to convert. Instead, he converted to Anglicanism. And Vivian, according to Valerie Eliot, although she made fun of his religiousness, didn't outright hate it like she does in the film. The Wasteland gathered cult-like status, and upon its first printing in the US, there were additional notes to help explain some of the more oblique references. However, Eliot's notes only served to make things more complicated. It was a sort of highbrow trolling, if you will. Eliot left his tiny underground office at Lloyd's of London in 1925 and joined the publishing company Faber and Guire, later Faber and Faber, where he would go on to become a director. In 1927, the same year that he converted to Anglicanism, he became a British citizen, all while spending less and less time with Vivian, who was often in sanitariums or drugged up on bromide. She had, over time, become a nervous wreck. As the film notes, she took to carrying around a toy knife and accused Elliot of affairs and denied to friends in the street that she even was Vivian Haywood. When he was invited to lecture at Harvard for a year in 1932, he used it as a means to escape the unpredictable Vivian. They officially separated in 1933. After this, she would turn up at the Faber and Faber offices in attempts to see him, but never quite as the film illustrates. Incidentally, Elliot preferred vanilla ice cream with chocolate syrup, and when a man once said to him in a restaurant, I can't believe a poet like you can eat that stuff, Elliot replied, ah, but you're not a poet, and kept on eating. The doors of Faber and Faber, according to Valerie Elliot, who was a former employee of the company, were never locked in the manner Tom and Viv shows, and the receptionist had a special way of ringing Elliot to notify him that his wife was outside causing a scene. Her behaviour often meant that he would escape out of a back exit to avoid her. She also posted a notice in the Times, Will T.S. Eliot please return to his home, 68 Clarence Gate Gardens, which he abandoned, September 17th, 1932. He only saw her once more, when she turned up at a book exhibition in 1935, dressed in her British Union of Fascist uniform, and carrying three books and their dog. The fact that the nervous and perpetually uncomfortable T.S. Eliot managed to look after this woman from 1915 to 33 shows that no matter what he said later, at the time, he did care. And what happens to Vivian next is a result of the unfortunate circumstances which she found herself in. In the film, her doctors and family are gathered along with Elliot to confront Vivian, aiming to check her mental state. Then a few days later, she is dragged off by men in white coats. A letter from Morris Hay Wood, dated 14th of July, 1938, disproves this scene. Dear Tom, I am very sorry to have to write to you on your holiday, but I'm afraid I must. V was found wandering the streets at 5 o'clock this morning and was taken to Marleybone Police Station. The inspector at the police station told me that she had talked in a very confused and unintelligible manner and appeared to have various illusions. And if it had not been possible to get a hold of me or someone to take charge of her, he would have felt obliged to place her under mental observation. As soon as I got to the city, I rang up Dr. Miller. He feels V must either go to the Malmaison or to some home. V had apparently been wandering about for two nights, afraid to go anywhere. She is full of the most fantastic suspicions and ideas. She asked me if it was true that you had been beheaded. She says she has been in hiding from various mysterious people and so on. A month later, Morris wrote to Elliot again to tell him Vivian had been taken to Northumberland House, a sort of nursing home. 
In the film, a short time after Elliot and Vivian's family and doctors gathered to hold an intervention, there is a scene in a tea rooms. Oh, tea and cake. Don't mind if I do. Don't worry, I'm sure nothing magic happens while this is going on. <laughs> the violent tea room kerfuffle in Tom and Viv, Vivine went quietly after having a long conversation with the medical personnel. Elliot was not as cold and detached about the whole situation as he was portrayed. He was told by the doctors not to visit her, and apparently lost his hair from worrying about her. According at least to Valerie Elliot, Vivian was kept in the most comfortable part of Northumberland House, and felt so comfortable there that she didn't even wish to leave during the war, and Elliot feared that she would be safer being moved to Brighton and being provided with a private nurse. Valerie Elliot also mentions T.S. Elliot was kept informed of how she was doing, and that she never quite regained her full capacities. While the film states nobody ever tried to have her released, Vivian is said to have refused to leave Northumberland House whenever a chance arrived. Vivian Haywood died in 1947 of a heart attack, and this film would have you believe that T.S. Elliot plagiarised her work and cast her aside once his career took off. But I'm not even sure that the film can get away with that, even within its own settings. It's long established within the film that Vivian had suffered for many years with various health problems and wild behaviour. Yet somehow later in the film, it becomes Elliot's fault that the problems, which were there before she met him, became more rampant. Morris Haywood apparently stated before his death that both he and Elliot were responsible for Vivian spending the rest of her life in care, and he and Elliot were the executors of her estate. The film seems to be an attempt to capture Morris's guilt over the issue, but does it in a way as to throw dirt on T.S. Eliot. It's worth noting that Michael Hastings, who co-wrote the screenplay and wrote the original play, once described Eliot as one of the American fascists who maligned modern culture. So his view on Eliot was already skewed to the point where he would turn him into a monster. But his view on Elliot is tremendously one-sided and elevates Vivian to a pedestal which he probably does not deserve to be on. The case with many writers who want to detract from Elliot is that they want to say that he was cruel to Vivian. But she also showed signs of being incredibly unstable. And let's not even start with the arguments that Elliot was secretly gay. Because basically if you're a major figure in English literature, somebody is going to say that you're gay at some point. Unless of course... You are acknowledged to be gay, or you really, really, really stated your love for vaginas while you were alive. I'm looking at you, James Joyce. In 1957, Elliot married again to Valerie Fletcher, his secretary. She was 30 and he 68. And while he never produced any poetry in those final eight years, he seemed to have finally found happiness with Valerie. Tom and Viv is not all that remarkable, aside from Defoe's often surprising physical resemblance to Elliot and his rather good impression of Elliot's unique voice. The film is however carried by Miranda Richardson. She was nominated for both a BAFTA and an Oscar for her performance, and had she been in a better film, she probably would have won. Still, unless, like me, you're curious to see a film about T.S. Elliot, I would not seek out Tom and Viv. Outside of the lead actors, it's mostly unremarkable and a little tedious. And now, to close this episode, I would like to perform the popular song, Memory, from Cats. A good idea, don't you agree? No. No. Oh, please, God, no. No! Don't do it. <laughs> you can regret it, really. <laughs> Nobody ends with memory. Well, except maybe Elaine Page. The no, no, sweetie, you really don't have to. No, no, just no, no, no. Memory all alone in the moonlight. I can smile for the old days. I was beautiful then. I remember a time I knew what happiness was. Memory, live again. Every 
seems to meet a fatalistic warning. How do I get out of here? Oh God, no! And the street lamp gutters, and soon it will be. They said my voice was grating. Of a new life, and I mustn't give in. Oh, jump start. Oh, it's lemon. Oh, well. Appreciating my beautiful singing voice. I'll know what I'll do. I'll read them the wasteland. <clears throat> April is the coolest month. Breeding lilacs out of a dead land. Mixing memory and desire. Stirring stone roots with spring rain.